Do you know the story that inspired the classic Friday the 13th? Today we're going to talk about four teenagers that decide to go camping in the Finland woods. It all takes place on June 4th, 1960, where these four teenagers arrive at this big, beautiful lake. The first to arrive with the friend group was Mela and Nils. Not too long after, the other couples, Seppel and Anja, arrived to meet their friends at the campsite. The group of friends can see that all the different families having all these types of fun in the boats, swimming in the water. They could see that the forest wraps around the whole entire lake. Mela felt like this place was an absolute wilderness getaway. She loved the outdoors and the group of friends were actually out there celebrating Mela's 16th birthday. So when Seppel arrived, he wanted to like really impress his friends about his motorcycle. So he came in really fast, spun around, braked really hard, and just overall tried to look really cool. And Mela saw it was very funny. She started laughing, she thought they were having a good time, until she glanced at Nils. Nils turned around and saw that his girlfriend was laughing all hard and heavily at Zeppo. So next to the water there was actually this small snack shack so the friends decide to walk towards that direction and see what they had over there. As the friends were walking to get snacks from the snack shack, Seppo actually made a comment saying that his motorcycle was better than Neil's. That comment made Mela giggle and remember Mela is Neil's girlfriend? So as she's laughing, she happens to glance over at Niels, her boyfriend. Where he happened to look very upset and is just scowling her and Seppo and just like straight staring at them in kind of like a disgust. Mela instantly stops laughing and she thought she was coming off as if she was flirting with Seppo and she really didn't want to look like that. Like she wasn't trying to do that. She just thought the joke was funny so she laughed. Neil was just kind of taken aback from this. When Mila looks back, she realized that Neil is laughing and smiling and having a good time overall. So she starts to think like maybe I'm imagining him being upset. I don't, she doesn't really know. She's like kind of confused. Like she thought she made it up in her head. The group then decide they want some snacks and drinks. So they head over to the kiosk, which is located in the beginning of the camping site. So as they arrive to the snack kiosk, Mila realizes that the woman working the kiosk doesn't really acknowledge them, has her back turned, like doesn't really care about the kids, like it's just kind of pretty much ignoring them on purpose. So they're at the kiosk and Mila's like really wants to buy something. So she sees the woman and she's like trying to get her attention. She's like, excuse me. And the woman like spins around really fast and looks at Mila and says, what do you want? So Mila, she just like kind of mumbles sorry and she pretty much just asks for like some beers and some sodas from the lady. While this is all happening, you know, Zeppo and Anja were just kind of like laughing at her, like just thinking it was so funny the whole time. Like they were just <laughs> like laughing because the kiosk lady was so rude to her. And so while this woman is like grabbing all their drinks and stuff, she's like mumbling stuff and she's like super angry and like ticked off at them for even like walking up to her stand, like the kiosk, like she's just overall like m super, super pissed, right? Mila noticed all these like empty bottles that were surrounding the shack and behind the shack. So she assumed that the kiosk lady was like mad that she had all these empty bottles. She was like making assumptions like maybe kids before her or whatever didn't pay for them or something, or th maybe the woman was like overwhelmed with all these bottles. like she didn't really understand she was kind of making assumptions like maybe they were like drinking too much or something or just like the fact that like there were since there were so many bottles it really wasn't like a happy home i don't know she was just kind of like coming up with all these like ideas in her head right so as neil's paying for all these bottles the kiosk lady was like oh are you guys staying out by the lake and Mila answers like yeah we're camping out there like thinking that maybe the woman's trying to make up for her being rude and then the woman replies like no you guys better set up as far as possible from the shack like I don't want to see you guys and the kids just kind of like look at each other in disbelief and like are questioning like why is this woman being so rude like what is happening right now the group is just kind of like in disbelief and they're just kind of looking at each other in like this awkward silence 
and then like she kind of like puts her hands up and like shoes for them to go away and as a group is like walking away she yells like i'm sick of having teenagers at the campsite friends and stuff are like looking at each other like what is happening right now like they were just like in disbelief that the woman is even like acting like this you know so the group just kind of like started laughing and thought this lady was crazy uh, but the mila on the other hand she was kind of questioning it and was actually a little scared as to why this woman was acting like this towards them well, after that incident the teens you know took a short motorcycle ride to their campsite where it was had like such a beautiful view of the lake and there was like heavily forested and there was just all these pretty trees and it was just really overall like a beautiful spot when they arrive you know they pull out their little tent so basically they tied a string to like two trees and they hung over their tent in that kind of way so it was like an old-fashioned kind of like tent and you know they started drinking they had a fire they started to just have like a really nice night and enjoy their time you know camping so they really just wanted to forget about that terrible kiosk lady so they go for a swim enjoy the sunset just really enjoy nature and just have a really good time with their friends you know during this time of year in finland the sun doesn't really go away completely so when it's time to go to bed it's like technically there's still a lot of sunlight left out so the group became tired after a fun night so they decided to go in their tent you know to have some rest in the middle of the night mila was like awoken by this like rustling sound she heard outside her tent she's like what the heck is that she, she's like she like sprung up and like is looking around she's like what could be that noise She's like looking all around her tent. She's like, maybe it can be one of my friends, but it's like too dark to see anything. When all of a sudden she like looks in front of the tent and she sees this like huge shadow figure. And remember, it's like still like bright outside because of the way the sun sets. So she just sees this like dark figure and like all the sunlight behind it, you know? She's like, what the heck is that? She's like terrified. When Mila's looking at this figure, she sees these like bright red glowing eyes and before she can get a word out like the tent suddenly like collapsed okay now get this so there is these two boys and their dad and they were fishing at the same lake that the teens were staying at and they said early in the morning that they recall seeing a tall blonde haired man running away from the directions that the teens you know were staying at and they thought it was weird uh they they noted it but they didn't like head over in that direction they're just like hmm that's kind of weird like why is this guy running away like where is he running to where is he running away from like i don't know i just thought it was weird but they just continued fishing you know so more and more people started to arrive at the you know campsite but no one really head over into that direction until a father and son decided they wanted to go over to a dock that was over there and go fishing so the father and son decided to walk like you know the same trail that niels and seppo walked to get to their campsite so as the father and son are walking the father notices that piece of cloth or like fabric hanging between two trees and you can see it's like all ripped up and there's pieces that are like shredded and it's like all over the floor so the father's curious he gets a little bit closer starts walking closer and closer and when he realizes what he sees he turns around yells at the boys and tells them we have to leave right now so they call the police ring 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 yeah there's a murder in the woods and so the police arrive and they couldn't believe what they were looking at when the police arrive they see a crumpled up tent and four lifeless bloody bodies laying on the ground sadly anja and seppo's bodies didn't get to make it out their bodies were found inside the tent stabbed to death Mela was able to make it out of the tent but sadly her body was found on the ground stabbed a total of 15 times Police were able to determine that majority of Mela's stab wounds happened while she was alive, but sadly a lot followed after she had died. Next to her body lay Niels, where his face was beaten in so bad he was unrecognizable. Police move in to get a closer look at the bodies when they hear a light, faint gasping sound. So Niels, remember who was Mela's boyfriend? So suddenly his eyes sprung open. So Niels was still alive. Like the officers were so in shock they didn't know what to do. They were just standing there in disbelief. 
yelled for a medic to take him to the hospital. And while the investigators were looking at the crime scene, they were saying it doesn't make sense. Like all the positions and how it was all set up and how the bodies were laying, like none of it made sense to them. So while investigators are looking at the crime scene, they notice missing watches and missing wallets and they start to think maybe it was a robbery like gone wrong. But as they're looking, they strangely notice like both the boys' keys to their motorcycles are gone and Neil's jackets and shoes are gone. The police then call in military for a better search of evidence and boy do they find something. 500 miles away from the campsite, they find Neil's shoes splattered with blood. Police start to think maybe the killer put the shoes on, committed the murders, walked 500 miles away, and decided to take the shoes off. They were just thinking, why would the killer want to wear these shoes? Sadly, Neil was the only survivor of this attack. It took him months to even speak because of all the broken bones in his face. Neil was able to speak again a few months later, but he couldn't recall anything that happened that night. It was a total blur. Say he saw that night was a black shadowy figure with red glowing eyes. The only evidence the police really had was those two boys that were fishing saw a blonde haired man running away from their campsite. Police create a composite sketch to hand out to the locals in the community to ask if anyone has seen this man. So although the police were getting many reports, a lot of the reports were false and just overall dead ends. Although the sketch did look like many men in Finland, it didn't really help. The police did end up getting a tip. So a day after the murders took place, a man named Han Osman checked himself into a hospital where he had dirty fingernails, he had bruises and scrapes all over his body. He checked in saying he had severe stomach pain, but by the looks of it, it was so much more. He was covered in blood from head to toe, had all these weird wounds, and you can tell that he's been through like a scuffle. So the hospital he checked into was exactly 13 miles away from the campsite and he was complaining of severe stomach pain. The doctors and nurses don't believe him and he seems to be really drunk and aggressive and just overall just really weird state and he just continues to lie. He refuses to explain the stains that are on his body and clothes and the doctors decide to call the police. For interviewing Hans, the police realize how close to the description he fits of that running man. Remember the running man that was um, running away from the campsite? Like he fits the exact descriptions. And so the police notice it and they're alerted and they realize they have their guy. So Han starts to mention to the police that he has a history of aggression and violence and he's part of the Nazi party and the Russian secret police. So he's just telling all these, you know, all this information to the police and the police are just writing everything down and taking note and are just kind of like in shock. To the police, Hans just seems like a very unstable, strange individual. Get this. So, Hans had a stable alibi the night of the murders. Hans was in another city 15 miles away the night the murders happened. It's said that he was at his girlfriend's house with his brother and sister-in-law and they were having dinner. So this really surprised the police, like they wanted him to be their guy. And based off the evidence, it just wasn't possible. The police went on the interview 4,000 people and just kept hitting dead end after dead end. And the case grew cold for 44 years. In 2004, prosecutors determined that Niels Malo's boyfriend was the murderer that night. A piece of evidence that prosecutors wanted to point out that a woman staying across the campsite heard two men fighting that night. They assumed that Niels got really angry at Seppo for flirting with Mila. Thought maybe Niels felt betrayed and lied to and he just had all this anger that he just snapped. That really explained why Mila was stabbed so many times. They thought it was more like a crime of passion. Thought Niels got super angry and just got out of control and unfortunately took it out on everyone that night. 
Well, the shoes that were found that night were covered with everyone else's blood but Neil's. Tried hiding the shoes far away that night and made self-inflicting wounds on himself to make it seem like he also got attacked. 44 years later, Niels was placed under arrest for the murder of his friend at the age of 62. Niels maintained his innocence at trial and stated he couldn't remember anything that happened that night. Niels stated that he saw a black figure that night with red glowing eyes, and the rest was just a blur. The jury believed them and he was acquitted. Niels was released from prison and awarded a settlement for his suffering. There are speculations that a man named Carl Valdemar Gilstrom, a 55-year-old man who lived at Lake Bodum, was actually the one who had murdered those kids that night. And Carl was known to lash out and get really upset and hated vacationers and teens and the young generation. Like, he just overall hated people visiting the lake. It said that he was to fire guns at campers and just be rude and complain about the teens all the time and just lash out in all these angry fights and just be just totally disgusting towards people. Locals were convinced that Carl had done these murders. They even told police and they kept bothering them until one day police go out to talk to Carl and end up meeting his wife. You are not going to believe who Carl's wife is the kiosk lady remember the kiosk lady that was being really rude to the teenagers in the beginning like she was just overall just didn't want them there at all yeah that's his wife oh so when the murders actually happened they came and questioned her and said hey where are you or where was carl that night and she stated that oh he was at home with us like we were with the kids we stayed in we don't know what happened we weren't outside at all yeah, a little sus. A little sus. So, sadly, the police never questioned it. They were just like, okay, like, they're at home. Like, they, they never dove into it, never really got into detail or anything like that. And overall, just really sad. Many locals name him as being the murderer and they for sure know that he was the one that did it because he had that temper and he just hated people that were not from that town the vacationers and he was not a fan of young kids so they had a lot of reasons as to why he was the one that did it nine years later carl actually admits to his neighbor that he's the lake bottom killer and the neighbor says well if you really are the killer you should drown yourself and that's exactly what he did the following day carl had walked into the lake drowned himself and it was exactly at the same spots where all the teens were killed police couldn't determine if it was a drowning or if he did it on purpose they really didn't know what happened some people believe that carl had so much guilt inside of him from killing those innocent teens that he took his neighbor's advice and just ended his life after so many years what do you guys think do you think he did it do you think it was a cover-up did you think it was the friends i don't know so many like missing details and i feel like they just found someone to blame and they went with it just to solve their case honestly man and those investigators really suck like they just <sighs> so sad it's so sad what happened to those kids and you know they just went out to have a good time and only one came back sadly and if carl hated kids so much why didn't you just move carl why did you have to murder these innocent people like you couldn't have moved like i'm pretty sure there's a lot of other lakes in the world like you couldn't go somewhere else to be have like peace and quiet so friday the 13th is inspired in a way from this movie it really has a lot of the same details and everything and i just thought that was a crazy fact that maybe you guys didn't know but yeah this was just a horrible horrible thing that happened do you think the friend did it? I don't think the friend did it. Like, and was this man Carl, was he like watching them the whole entire time? Like, was he stalking them? I don't, I just don't know. Like, it just, it's a lot of missing pieces and no one will really know what happened that night because sadly, almost all of them are dead. And, you know, it's just 
overall a really sad story if you guys like stories like this and you guys want me to do more please comment down below i I'm trying something new and I'd like to know how you guys feel about this. But thank you for watching as always. Um, I really appreciate you guys. And yeah, so stay spooky. Bye.